discussion of trauma and mental health and how we are going to be breaking that cycle. So, if you've ever wondered why traumatic experiences seem to echo across generations, leaving an inedible mark, it's how do we break the cycle? How do we get through it? How do we get out of that complex relationship between trauma and mental health? So these are the questions that this incredible panel is going to be discussing. I'd like to invite to the stage Michael Angelo Giannato. I'd like to invite George Lee, uh, Jason Corning alongside with his interpreters. Heather Stokes, and moderating the session would be Rachna Vimani. If I can have all those panelists come up to the stage, please. All right, we've got Jason on stage, George Lee, Michelangelo, Heather and Rachna. Rachna Mimani. Yeah. Yeah. There she is. Look at her. All right. Excuse me. I can't do closer because sit up very closer, so I I got you see. Thank you very much, panel. The stage is yours. Good evening, everyone. So, few of us here, but we're talking something important, and that is mental health and trauma. So, I would love the panel to introduce themselves first. Hi, my name is Heather Auburn Stokes. I'm the founder and CEO of Serenity Light Recovery. We are an addiction treatment center in Texas, and we um, it's a constant battle that we face to um, combat uh, mental health trauma and um, even the effects that it has on the families and the communities at, at whole. Hi, everyone. My name is Mitch Nado. CEO of Rolanda Health Group in the Philippines. We have the Life Science Center for Health and Wellness, which is a functional medicine clinic. Uh, it's a multi specialty clinic. Um, within it is a facility called Mind Plus, which incorporates uh, epigenetic approaches to improving uh, mental health. Good afternoon. My name is George. I'm from Singapore. I am the CEO and founder of the Mind Synergy school that trains coaches, trainers, therapists, and we deal directly with um, ground issues uh, ranging from kids as young as like 15 years old to uh, very experienced traumatic performer uh, as old as 70 or 80 years old. So uh, yeah, I hope to share my experience and my observation as a practitioner on the ground, how we deal with, well, sadly to say, some of them are like bringing on the trauma. Hi everyone, my name is Jason. I'm with the company Mizaru. We focus on awareness and education and spreading the word uh, for community support with individuals with disabilities. A lot of people with disabilities have traumatic experiences because the companies and places where they're trying to get services don't understand those communities. And so we're raising awareness and understanding. We're helping them to see the disability perspective and hopefully reduce trauma because of that knowledge. Thank you so much for your lovely introductions, and I am Raksha Nimani, co-founder of EasyTogether.com. I'm also a mental health professional working in relationship coaching, not just with your loved ones, but with your partner relations as well. So, uh, moving ahead, you know, trauma, when we hear a word, we hear many images and sound around us. All right, 
So today in this room, when we go in and deep dive into this panel, I would want you to leave every other name that you have beside just your name. If you're a doctor, drop it. If you're a mister, drop it. If you're a missus, drop it. Or if you're a miss, just drop it. Be just the who you are in that real presence, experiencing the entire discussion here in terms of trauma. So when we talk about trauma, we are not just talking about a soldier seeing war happen in front of him and people die. We are not just talking about doctors seeing patients die. We are talking much more deep. We are talking about the child health abuse. We are talking about life after the natural disasters, life after facing life-threatening incidences, the emotional impact, the you know never dying images that is left on us, and how do people around us and we ourselves deal with us? I'm sure when we are sitting here in the room and when I talk about it. Every one of us might have gone through a trauma in our own ways. So my first question goes to the team, and that is that how to heaven? How would you define trauma and the different ways that it manifests? Trauma can look like a lot of different things, right? It's a disturbing experience, um, and I believe it's life-altering. Um, once someone experiences trauma, they, be, they are different, right? They're never going to be the same, but you can teach them how to overcome and adapt and actually become stronger, right? Um, I work with a lot of individuals that suffer from mental health and addiction, and it is their escape. It's not that they're just, there's a more, like moral failing, right? but they are self-medicating, trying to block out memories, the fear, the anger, um, and it manifests in, in so many different ways. And, um, you know, the, the military, it used to be 22 veterans uh, committing suicide a day. It's doubled now, 44. There's somebody overdosing every seven minutes because of the trauma that they are trying to escape. And that I'm not okay with that. Something needs to be done. So. Uh, we would like Mitch to elaborate a little more with some examples and experiences that he's had in his, in his uh, life. Yeah, I think uh, I haven't captured that quite accurately to use the word escape as one of the top of signs for trauma. But it's also remembered that uh, trauma, the response to trauma, um, I, I like to be able to present it more from a perspective of you know, the two ways that we respond as people, being that there are people who are more likely to escape or go fight, right, or fight or freeze, right, and these are signs of people who are not able to cope with trauma. But it's even with people who are resilient that there is trauma. And some there, there are people that the way that they cope with trauma is to, even in their resilience, to rewind and play the, the incident and then the, the kind of conversation in their heads. Right? So it may not appear to be as bad as those who have a more stressful response, but there is still a telling sign of trauma in such situations. Right. Thank you so much, Richard. I understand that trauma can manifest Ways, all right. Uh, I am moving to Jason to explain how trauma, you know, when we are talking about culture, when we are talking about inclusivity, how does trauma implicate on them and what is its impact on them? Well, I think I'd share just as a person who has disabilities, growing up and experiencing bullying, frustrations, not having access so much information around me missing. And so when I go into an environment and I say what I need, people often dismiss or ignore my concerns and say you'll be fine. Or just expect me to accept what's going on. And what that does is it continues to build on top of each other. And the responsibility is on me to handle all of these incidents and all these problems. And 
I don't know how to solve these problems. I don't know how it's bothering them. I don't know the size and scope of it all. And so to have to go through all this experience and be responsible for it, it's hard to then be able to express the pain that's inside. And it doesn't get out. And so that pain continues to fester. So as we know that trauma comes in spectrums now, how do we move ahead and tackle such impacts? What are the strategies and intervention Mr. Lee would like to answer that? Strategies, well, it's a science or an art. It's a deep question. Like, what's the right way to deal with trauma? What is trauma? It means different things to different people. Rajna have mentioned uh, trauma doesn't happen to only military veterans who have been through losses, grievances, or, or missing something out. I was trained as a soldier for 24 years of my life, and in my previous career and profession, well, to be very honest, we are trained to kill, right? That's what soldiers go through. We are trained to kill. And I'm proud to say that I have never gotten on a mission success because I was never set up on a mission to kill. I come from Singapore, it's a peaceful army. And people start asking, now Singapore is a peaceful country, why do you need an army? Quite ironic, like, I spent two and a half decades of my life training how to defend my country. And that's where I start to realize that my mission is actually not to go into a war, it's to prevent one. If you don't have an army to defend yourself, that's where you are more likely to go into a war situation, which is uh, probably happening and it's what we can see in the political situation around the world. Now the truth is this, as a soldier trained to kill for the right reason, none of us want to go into war. The truth is this, we are training for something that we don't want to happen. But if it ever happens, that's, there, there's a solution, there's a contingency plan, there is an action plan. And that's what we mean by None of us want to get into a traumatic experience. But let's touch our heart. We are all human beings, like what Rajna said. If you are a doctor, drop it. If you are a lawyer, you can drop it. There would be a situation where you will have experienced trauma, maybe in your childhood, maybe in someone that's close to you. And it's about how do you relate to that event. Now, as we are speaking right now, I am very sure someone that we don't know in this part of the is experiencing losses. Maybe it's dying right now, it's going through a sexual abuse situation. And because you don't know, that's why you don't feel as bad as the person that's going through. So this strategy that I deal with my client, I use it uh, with my client, is this strategy of association and dissociation. Trauma looks and feels real when you are fully associated with it. Just like a when you're watching a movie, you're totally engrossed. Uh, Marvel, Superman, whatever it is, you, you feel like you're flying in love with, with Spider-Man with nothing for, holding you on except this thin little spider web that swings you from building to building. Because you're fully associated with movies. Trauma is the same. Like what Mitch mentioned, it is a movie that the, the movie controller decides to play and replay and replay non-stop in their mind. But the truth is this, is this event that has happened before happening right now? The answer is no, it is not real. So trauma is nothing but purely memories. If you're able to dissociate from the memory, then I would say that emotionally at least, we can deal with what's inside us so that what's outside us can then follow on more positive. So that's the strategy. If you're able to dissociate, I feel that um, it's, a, it's a good management technique, coping mechanism. Okay. So a powerful technique associated, <coughs> associated and it's just about the memories that you hold about the incident that happened in your life. Moving on to Mitch, Mitch, you've been also working in the strategies and intervention space. So what would you recommend there? Yeah, so um, in my practice, I'm a certified functional medicine health coach kinds of clients I see in my program of health plans, I see a lot of cancer patients. And uh, one of the things I realize with the cancer patients I see is that the trauma alone of getting the diagnosis seems to be a major hump. A lot of 
these patients are not able to move uh, forward to life, right? And it's not very difficult to reconsider patients with other ailments and other uh, non communicable disease conditions have trauma. Because we take for granted the fact that being diagnosed is actually a traumatic event. And it gets swept under the rug and, you know, uh, maybe chronically suffer from such trauma. So, so one approach we do, uh, perhaps a uh, bit connected to what you've spoken about, uh, is, really, is really to be able to uh, process self-talk, right? And understand whose voice is playing in your head, what is it saying, what's the tone of that voice, and what's the message. And it's teaching clients to be able to speak to that voice so they can disassociate. So this is, this is the tool we employ inside of our practice uh, in, in a multi-practitioner uh, kind of perspective. So watch your voice, what you are talking about it, to yourself. So that's one of the, another powerful technique or a strategy that you can take in while dealing with traumas for you and your people around you. Moving on to Jason. Jason, you've been experiencing uh, this, seeing it in your environment, seeing it with people with disabilities and inclusivity, experiencing it. How do they, and what are their uh, strategies and intervention techniques? <laughs> well, I think I can share a few tips some recommendations, uh, but it's important to keep in mind that individuals, you know, how you want to help is one person is not going to be the same for each person. You have to do it individual by individual in our community because the disability range is so different. You know, whether you know, there's energy that's involved, there's a lot of things to emphasize. You just make sure that the community lines of communication are open and that they have a full amount of support, whether that's therapy or psychologist. There's so many I've met who have said, you have to change. And for us in the disability community, the question is, why is it that we have to continue to change when the pain is inside of us? And so each individual dealing with those circumstances won't have necessarily the effort or the energy to be able to you know, move pass it in, in a self-initiated uh, way. And so, a lot of people just kind of process it as that's life, it's unfortunate. And I know that about 40% of complaints in the medical system are about failure to provide access. And so then individuals are afraid to go to where they can get treatment because they're afraid of how hard they have to work just to be able to have access, the embarrassment of being there. I mean, there are so many barriers to them even just getting in the door. So I like to encourage individuals in our community that they have to find a safe place first where they can express what's going on and they can get it from in to out and to begin to come up with that game plan. You know, the stimulus is just ongoing. And then like they said, you know, when that continues to replay, can then just actually cause them to dissociate from what's going on around them as opposed to from the problem, because then everything feels like it's on their shoulders. Um, and so it's not knowing how to approach different situations, oppression. There's so many individuals who don't realize that they are being oppressed, oppressed for their disability, for their lack of vision, for their lack of hearing, for their lack of ability to move. And so you have these different structures and systems in place that we have to be able to move beyond. We have to get to a point where there's equity in the community. And when our community has access to resources, they get access to that information as well. Yes, I think being available to the people and being sensitive around people around us and helping them cope up with what they are going through is, I think, moving a step towards an empathetic world. And that's what Jason provides in his conversation. Moving to Heather, Heather, you see diverse amount of clients, other problems, and rehabilitating them in this space. How does the cultural diversity uh, create an impact on the trauma and the treatment? That's a good question. Um, well, you know, 
in a treatment facility, in a treatment environment, it can be very intimidating, right? Um, a lot of fear, um, a lot of confusion. You know, uh, they may have experienced um, significant punishment for even admitting that they had a problem or going to prison, um, right? So it's a lot of fear base. Um, at Serenity Life, we, um, we strive to create a safe place for them to be able to come and feel loved, not judged, and be surrounded by people that have experienced it themselves. I am a person in long-term recovery. Trauma in my childhood, trauma throughout my life, led to addiction. And I never thought that it would ever happen to me. And it is something that I do not wish upon anyone. But it took other people that walked that path ahead of me to hold my hand and say, it's okay, you're not alone, and we're going to get through this together. For once, I felt accepted. I wasn't chasing this desire of just feeling okay, right? Someone extended their hand that has been there, said, we will get through it together. So I think no matter where we are in life, whether it's in a facility, at the workplace, at civic centers, there needs to be individuals trained that have had lived experiences to be able to be relatable and build that rapport saying, I will sit with you and it's gonna be okay, right? This is how I've overcome and this is how many have overcome. Um, and so when we look at it in a treatment facility at Serenity, there's so many different lives that come in. And you know what Jason was saying, that um, it is crucial that you provide individual lives customized treatment. Everyone is different. We recover together, but everyone is different. What works for me may be different for you. You may not hear something or see something the way that we presented it, but let's find what works for you. What feeds your soul? Meet an individual where they're at and then help them experience different modalities, not one way is the only way, one program fits all, allow them to remove the barriers for themselves. At least I have put up a lot of barriers for myself, right? Feel safe to remove that and surrender and say, I just want help and get well, so. Yeah, thank you, and I think that's a very important answer is training as, uh, you know, individuals. If we ourselves can pick up a resource to help somebody uh, overcome their own trauma, or if we can just reach out with a hand forward and say, we can get through it together, because that's the power of community, that's the power of people around us, and that's what makes us more human, and making us come out from all this AI and technology world, and addressing the real life problems in the real way, and not getting it shut away. Could I, much I would like you to expand on that. Yeah, actually, I wanted to add a little bit to what Ted had said, I think it's very important it's been emphasized enough by, by everyone on the floor that it's important for us to be patients where we are, right? And one thing I like about uh, training I received, there's this mnemonic that we use that allows us to have this sort of system in process to be able to personalize how we meet patients where they're at. And it, it, it goes by go to it, G O D O I T. Gather. Right? It's for gathering the information and gathering oneself before we meet other patients. And then the O is to organize the information that we receive as we gather it. And then we tell that story to the patient. So that that's how we create the kind of relationship to collaborate and cooperate with the patient. And after we tell that story, we work with the patient to organize the priorities. So which areas are you most comfortable in? which areas are, 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 are uh, leaping out. And then from there, we initiate the program and then we track it. And then, then we cycle again to the gap instead. So, so this is the modality that we use so that we're able to bring in a physical therapist, a nutritionist, a doctor, a psychotherapist, a health coach, into a program where we're all looking at the same data and we're all understanding the different facets of an individual. 
Because I mean, if you ask me about a patient, I see it from a behavioral perspective, I'm a health coach. But when I hear the doctor speak about what's going on in the patient, or I hear about, so we have a, we have a physical studio where we use movement as training for the vestibular system to be able to release uh, uh, PTSD conditions or even um, addiction to clients by just using movement, right? So midline therapy and all of these things. So, so that's the mnemonic we follow to be able to uh, be respectful to the human in front of us in, in, a, in a therapeutic paradigm. Yeah, so there is no one size fit all kind of a therapy. We need to customize and personalize each therapy and look at it in a holistic way, right? Uh, moving to Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, in your experience, how can we effectively educate communities and institutions about trauma? And what role does prevention play in broader mental health landscape? A powerful question. Let me just summarize it in two words that Rajna has uh, mentioned in the long question. Education and prevention. So, as we deal with trauma, it's something that... Now, let, let's look at life as it is. Do we all agree that at some point in our life, in our childhood, in our juvenile years, or even adulthood, or maybe even after we retire from work, and some things will happen, right? Because uh, we are human beings. And if we acknowledge that at some point in our life, some trauma or some traumatic events could happen, it may happen, it, it's just a matter of how severe, how serious, how big or how small it is, then would we then agree that it would be good to have a skill set, to have the reactionary knowledge and action plan to deal with it when it comes along. So, that's where education comes in. Now, I'm an educator myself. I, I train, we train trainers, we train coaches, we train therapists to prepare them for the worst part of their life. And then I've got students that come up to me and say, hey, George, I, I do need this. My life is all good right now. I am, I am happy. I'm in the best place of my life. I'll come to you when I need it. I will answer that question using a typical example that I exactly use in my class. Let's talk about insurance. How many of us here in the room owns an insurance policy? Hands up. Are we sick at this point in time? Well, most of us will say no, we are all good. Then, why do you buy insurance when you're not sick? I will come to my insurance agent and say that I'll buy the policy when I'm sick. Now, try getting your insurance policy approved when you're sick. You realize no one buys it, no one sells it to you. Insurance is something that we buy and buy and buy, hoping that we will never need it. Does that make sense? When we go on travel, we buy travel insurance. Do you ever wish to claim from insurance like, I lost my luggage, I lost my laptop, I, I would like to make some money from claiming my insurance? No, we buy health insurance, we buy hospitalization plan. Uh, when we have kids, we buy more plans for our children. But we never hope that our children ever need to However, education and insurance, it works the same way. It is better to have it and not need it than to realize that you need it but you don't have it. So it is a preventive measure. This is where I see education comes in. Now, if every one of us is properly and adequately educated, then we will develop that, that strategy, individualized strategy deal with the trauma that will come along at some point in our life and that strategy is not told to you. It is developed by you. How do we develop that individualized strategy which uh, what Jason and what Mitch and Heather have all mentioned? It has to be customized. It has to be individualized. It has to be personalized. How do you make sure that it's individualized, it's personalized and it's customized? The only way that will work for you is that you are the designer of that strategy. So how do you then design a strategy that works for you? First of all, you have to know what is the problem you're facing. Acknowledgement, understanding it, and being aware that I'm facing this. I need help. Then after that, you sit down, go into a reflective mode and say, how should I handle this? Oh, I've learned this during uh, my preschool years. My, my mentor, my coach, my 
someone who had been through that shared with me that this was how he did it. And but what he went through is different from what I'm going through right now. However, there are absolutely options and alternatives and examples that I can pick up from those people that I know of and customize it in the way that I would think that they work for me. It is really a whole process of trial and error. So that's what I see. Correctly, then we will never need to adopt any corrective measures. I think that's very, very powerful. So, better to have it rather than hoping not to need it. But it's better not to have it at all or not, is a question at that point of time. But here is something that I would like to share. I think um, there was a time when I was seeing a client, and the client was continuously in anxiety attacks. And she, she got to many people around her. And nobody knew how to handle her when she was going through an anxiety attack. And she would just have an attack anywhere, you know, anywhere in a public space. So as our, as professional, what do I do to her? Was it just with her that she needed to build a coping mechanism and needed therapy? Or her caregivers also needed, uh, you know, therapy around it. So what I wanted to say here is that we as individuals form a society together. And if we all can extend that little arc of empathy to the other and we tell them that, you know, I am there and it is going to be okay. And even if it is not okay, nothing matters. And if it isn't, then we will just deal with it together. Right. And I think that's, that's something very, very important. Uh, moving to Jason. Jason, uh, the same question goes to you, that how do we need to make our communities more sensitive? to people with uh, disability and with impairment uh, progress and deal with their, you know, normal life traumas also at such a point of time. That's a good question. I like the words empathy and sympathy and the difference between the two of them. A lot of individuals will say, oh, I'm so sorry for or how do we support that? And it's this pity mentality. And the disability community is over there. We're done. We've gotten enough of that through our lives. You know, from parents, from friends, from teachers, and the list of people who are sympathetic, it's time for us to say, hey, I also have this issue. This issue is bothering me. This is what makes me uncomfortable. And what are the reasons behind it? And you're engaging in that empathy as opposed to I'm sorry for you. Uh, it, that's the difference to me between sympathy and empathy. You know, putting on the other person as opposed to engaging with, oh, we share this same idea. And then allowing them to say, how are you feeling? And to process the emotions with them. And then to say, how can I help you? And then to go through the process with them. And to say, oh, it's not right. It's not fair to say, I can see how that's so frustrating and how that is not working for you. To make the individual feel heard, understood, that their pain has been seen, and not that they're complaining, which is sometimes what they can get blamed for. That they're just whining about things. And so allowing a person with disabilities to also find the right way to express it. So if somebody called me a bad name, you know, if someone comes to you and said, they, they called me a bad name because of my disability, I said, oh, I'm sorry about that. As opposed to an individual with disabilities who doesn't have a, a chance to express when those things happen, they eventually lose it, right? They explode. And then the behavior becomes the focus. They say, that's not appropriate behavior in school. It's not appropriate because it draws too much attention. It's not appropriate because it's embarrassing or it's awkward for the social situation. So the criticism, again, goes back on the person with disabilities, not realizing that they even said or did anything wrong because they were just trying to express their frustration in that moment. And so they often get punished. They often get criticized. It doesn't matter where it happens. You know, if you think about justice system or mental health system and the abuses and the terrible things that have happened to people with disabilities systemically there, you know, and if you only behave well, you're good, but if you don't do the right thing, you get put into confinement at one point in our history. And so these are daily 
experiences and people that this community have reached their limit. There are a lot of people who are in jail because of an out an expression that happens without recognizing that they're a person with disabilities. You know, I mean, a lot of deaf people have been shot by the police because they thought they were being ignored when they just couldn't hear the officer. So there are so many differences in those experiences. And we need to recognize when we're coming to an individual, are we coming with sympathy or are we coming with empathy? Thank you so much, Jason. I think that's very empowering as well. Because a uh, lot many times, you know, when, when we are all stuck in our right place, we forget about some people who can't even make, uh, you know, make it to the uh, spot. And whether they are able or they're not uh, able is a different question. But we lose the perspective so it's time that we open our ears and focus on the people around us and hear them out. Right? So I think we're coming to the end of the panel and here is what we are looking at is that uh, your closing remarks on how we can make the world or you know, the places around us susceptible enough so that the traumas could be healed and we act as an empathy bomb to them. What can we do at our own? and educate people around us for the same thing. So I would start with awareness, bringing awareness and education, um, allowing individuals to have a voice and to have that empathetic listening, right? And to really listen and sit and create a safe space for them to openly um, discuss, remove the guilt and shame, right? Remove the judgment punishing themselves and I say that but my own experience right I was punishing myself more than anybody could possibly do it and I was terrified to reach out because of the judgment right but once I did my life transformed and so moving forward I think um, having a voice removing you know, uh, breaking down the stigma breaking down the silos, and meeting someone where they're at and saying, you are worthy, you are worthy for a good life, and you are loved, and let's do this together because you're not alone. <coughs> let's do this together, you know. Very well said. Um, I'm going to hold down my thoughts to make sure that uh, I can uh, deliver it in a specific way. Paris for now. Uh, psychiatrist Victor Frankl uh, says that between the stimulus and response there is a space and in that space is our power to choose our response in our response lies our growth and our freedom and uh, this insight of Frankl reminds us of the profound impact of mindfulness and intentionality in our interactions both with patients and colleagues our trauma is also found in the, in the practitioners that, that spells a world of difference in the kind of energy that we get to bring to the therapeutic relationship with our patients. And, uh, uh, and in this, I want to be able to highlight the fact that we are capable to uh, shift our response, right? By taking the space to be able to pause, think for ourselves instead of just reacting, and be able to uh, hopefully make ourselves present the situation that you find yourself in. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Um, well, I, I just love to use these two words whenever I deal with someone who is going through a trauma, uh, be it something that happened in the past or right now. Uh, it's called love and respect. But I'm going to dissect these two words down to a smaller bite size so that uh, it makes it easy for the client to understand. Now, I'm not a doctor. And the one that I'm working with is not a patient. So this is a very clear-cut uh, name or terminology that I make it clear. So since you're not a patient, there's nothing wrong with you. That's what most patients come up to, to doctors, like, Doc, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong, tell me what's wrong with you. And it's quite ironic because um, after doctors put us through tests and the test results show that everything's okay, now 
that's where the patient gets a bit uh, fidgety. It's like, no, there's something wrong with me. It's just not right. But the test says everything is fine. Can you go back home and rest? No, 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 doc. I think there's something wrong with the test results. It's like now the patient is trying to find out what's wrong with them. That's a, some, a, 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 a good example of trauma. So whenever someone who comes to me and share with me their traumatic experience, I first of all, I acknowledge and I will share with them this very sentence. Now, know that I respect you and I love you for you as a person, but I have no love and no respect for your problem. That's where we deviate, we dissociate the person with the perceived problem that we have. Because trauma is not real. It is in the memory. So if you, now what happens when you have love and respect? You allow that thing, that person, that event that you stay with, it has a reason for its presence. How do you then let those traumatic experiences or memories go? You've got to be disrespectful to them. You've got to unlearn them. Because without love and without respect, that thing or that memory does not have a place in your brain. Whatever, whichever part of it is wrong. And that's the only way that you will get that, that, that new life that we are all looking for to get out of the, the traumatic experience. Now, things that have happened can never be undone. It's about moving forward. And for those of us who are looking at moving forward, the first thing you've got to do is to acknowledge. The second step is to let go. When you acknowledge and is able to let go, then you will be able to get out of the traumatic memory that, that keeps playing in your head. So, love and respect. Thank you, Jason. Closing words. All right, I'd like to just again emphasize this ability. Individuals with disabilities will have pain that you cannot see. And as you're developing your programs, as you're offering your services, as you're advertising, as you're growing your business, whatever you're doing, you know, don't forget and leave out people with disabilities who then would maybe not be able to access what you're offering. And you might be able to say, oh, I don't have time to build that in right now. Maybe you're not even aware of the persons with disabilities who would want to access that. A lot of big companies are really focused on profits to start with. And that oppresses people in the disability community because we have to keep waiting to get in. So while you're building your business, take time, slow down, invite members of the disability community in, hear their stories, learn how you can accommodate them, give them equal access. You know, I hear a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI is great, I think it's good, but we're talking on race, Background, economic levels, which is good, that's all great, but individuals with disabilities are not included, and that's a diverse population as well. And it's just, it's just such a glaring gap for me. That's, our community is still not included in that DEI. So if you're going to do the talk, make sure you have the action behind it and the compassion to do things better. That was empowering for all of you all from our view. So here is what I think you should, you know, compromise for and compose for the, uh, you know, uh, tips and tricks and the strategies that we've got in this small poem that I have for you all. So in shadows cast by traumas deep, silent struggles, wounds that see, heavy heart with the weight they bear, seeking solace, an answer so rare. Amidst the pain, a flicker of hope, where compassion and empathy elope. People untied and a, a, a collective plea, hunting a heaven, free in spirit. Coins of kindness, a currency so bright, invested in healing, dispel in night. From shattered pieces, music forms, rebuilding lives is a general strong. Through Understanding a bridge we build, healing wounds that time has chilled, with empathy as a compass, a guiding light, hope blooms in the darkest night. So people, hurt people, hurt people. Let's not hurt anymore, 
just feel the world around us. With that, we conclude the panel. Any questions, we'd be happy to take. We do have one more comment that would like to be added. Hello? Yeah. Okay, hi everyone. Um, not a question actually, but um, your topic was very sensational. I wanted to share uh, because trauma is individual, as you mentioned. So can I you come closer to my picante? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me better now? Uh, you have mentioned trauma is an individual uh, process or steps or journey that each one of us have a different way. So I wanted to share as a survivor of trauma, uh, something from my side about the steps that I have went through. And that, um, the most interesting thing that we live, we come to life, trauma happened, life goes, but we stay still on where trauma happened. We can move forward because we hold on a situation that happened on our lives. And since that point, in order to be able to perform, we have to go through much pain. We need to, at the first beginning, I figured out that we need to share, we need to cry, we need to find the beloved ones, talk with them, share with them, feel secure. And we, when we feel a little bit relieved, then after that comes the next step where we should be aware that it's not our fault. We are not the cause. It's, we are not the problem. So after we gain this awareness, we jump into, after that, that we come to conclusion that life is not going to fix it for us, but we need to change it. So we became more responsible of what happened. We change what happened. We don't live as a victims, but we change that in order to gain. And after doing some more achievements, the last thing which is the most hard, I believe, in order to be able to gain the freedom of the heal, is that you need to forgive what's happened. So in order to leave something behind, leave your hand, forgive it, and move on for the um, upcoming chapter. That's my journey. I hope uh, that this helping anyone who is going through trauma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause to our panel. <laughs> if I can just ask everyone to take a step to the front of the stage so we can take a group photograph. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.